the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome one and all to the service of worship at Central Saanich United Church on this fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. With me today also welcome you, welcoming you are Amy Noel, Helen Wright, and Barbara Hansen. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday and the beginning of Holy Week. And I sincerely hope you'll join us for some or all of our Holy Week services. I am intending on providing daily services Monday through Thursday and on Saturday in Holy Week. These will be about 20 minute or so services. Uh, they feature scripture, times of silence, um, short meditation, and uh, prayer. I'm going to try to figure out how to do this on Zoom. <laughs> and so stay tuned and uh, uh, get the link out to you if you're interested in joining. They will be at 10 o'clock. Uh, in the morning on those days. As well, of course, there will be a Good Friday service and, and our Easter service. We're going to continue to offer online services only until such time as our faith community is fully immunized against COVID-19, hopefully by late spring or early summer. And then it looks like we might just be able to be all together worshiping safely in person once again. It has been a different year. And so I can't wait for that day when I can actually meet everybody. Uh, that will be very exciting. I commend to your reading the announcements that uh, were sent out in the bulletin and, and also the fact that my, the last article entitled Crosstalk is available too uh, in that bulletin. Today is the first Sunday in spring. Light and warmth are returning to the land. Light and warmth are represented in the light that goes from this flame. May the symbol of this lit candle remind us of the ever-present light of our Savior's love and guidance. And our opening hymn for today's service is found at Voices United, number 373, as comes the breath of spring. Oh, I'm 
Today is the fifth Sunday in Lent. This season offers us the opportunity to be more reflective of what it means to be God's people, with God's ways written on our hearts. As followers of Jesus, we have all experienced times when we have mistaken his identity or misunderstood his purpose in the world and in our lives. As people of faith, we confess that too often self-interest and selfish attitudes hinder or distract us from following Jesus. Too often we turn away from the challenging situations and difficult circumstances to which he calls us. In those times, we may fail to give of ourselves in loving service to others. As we extinguish the fifth Lenten candle, we recall the times we have struggled to be God's faithful people, the times we have failed to glorify God as we should. As we watch the smoke rise, we remember Jesus' words, then in following him, in our willingness to serve him, God will honor us, and we will receive true, authentic life eternal life. Knowing ourselves to be loved and blessed, we raise our voices in song. A prayer to you, O God. says the Lord, when I shall be your God and you shall be my people. In the new covenant of God is written on our hearts. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when all people shall know me, from the least to the greatest. The new covenant of God is written on our hearts. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will remember your sins no more. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, in this holy season of Lent, help us to take the time we need to listen to your word for us and for our church. Help us to make, take the time we need to be quiet before you and offer prayer from the heart. Help us to put the pressing issues of our life into perspective and focus on your all-embracing love. Help us to look outward to our families, our friends, our neighbors, and our struggling world. Help us to show the practical compassion of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. And our next hymn is Voices United 658. Oh, love, thou wilt not let me go. Yeah. 
Welcome Barbara Hansen to read scripture for us today. Let us pray. Ever faithful God, as we hear these words of scripture, train us by Christ's teaching. School us in Christ's faithfulness, that as we walk in Christ's way, we may know we may come to share in your glory. We ask this through Christ, our deliverance and our hope. Amen. Today's readings begin with Jeremiah's prophecy of a new covenant written on the people's hearts. For Christians, this prophecy is fulfilled in the good news that came to be preached and embodied in Jesus Christ. So reading from chapter 31 of the book of Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their spouse, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make 
with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to one another, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their inequity and remember their sin no more. The Gospel text is situated dramatically in the context of the festival of Passover, preceded by such events as Jesus raising Lazarus, Mary's anointing of Jesus' feet, and the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. The responses to these events are intensely divided as crowds of people gather to hear Jesus while others plot to destroy him. Reading from chapter 12 of the Gospel according to John. Now among those who went to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the human one to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains that just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, God will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? God, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. God. Glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. Here end the readings from the realm of Holy Scripture. And for the, these words and insights, we give God thanks and praise. Thank you, Barbara. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus says of himself, the hour has come for the human one to be glorified. Glorified. Glory. What is glory? What does it mean to be in your glory? When are you in your glory? If you are a gardener, you might be in your glory at the end of the growing season when you harvest those fresh vegetables you had so painstakingly planted and so carefully looked after. Or maybe you're in your glory right now as you anticipate and begin your spring garden. If you are a writer, you might be in your glory when the book you have long researched and then wrote and rewrote umpteen times is at long last finished and about to be published. If you are a musician, you might be in your glory 
is after much devoted practice, you finish your public performance and know you nailed it. Or you might be a hockey fan. When your favorite hockey team wins the Stanley Cup, you will be in your glory. I know I will. <laughs> when at work or play, when we throw our hands up in exhilaration or jump in sheer jubilation, when the adrenaline begins to flow and the heart pounds, those observing us will learn much about us. You need to watch us when we are in our glory if you want to know who we really are, what we live for, the things and persons and matters that define our identity. The Bible dictionary says that glory, kabat in Hebrew, doxai in Biblical Greek, implies weightiness and splendor. Glory is that which gives you weight, substance, that which makes you shine. At church, we may sing a doxology, a hymn that glorifies God. Well, what about Jesus' glory alluded to in our Gospel reading for today? Some Greeks come wanting to see Jesus. They have perhaps heard of his many signs and wonders. Who is this illustrious worker of miracles? A glorious person, no doubt. They want to witness this glory. The hour has come for the human one to be glorified, Jesus says of himself. Enough of this Galilean flesh and blood, ordinary human being. His disciples and these Greeks as well anticipate Jesus throwing off the cloak of humanity to reveal his glory. But Jesus' description of his glory is nothing less than shocking. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies. Often we praise God as the glorious one, high, exalted, all-powerful. Jesus speaks of divine glory as a seed falling to earth, dying. The true glory for Christ is not his exaltation, but his humiliation, his death on the cross. Traditionally, Christians have thought of God's glory as expressed by certain divine attributes. God on high, eternal, invisible, unchangeable, infinite, incomprehensible. Doxa, doxology, praising God and all God's glory. As we sometimes sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise God all creatures here below. And generally speaking, in the long history of the Christian faith, the construction of churches has attempted to express that glory. They were built to be immense and grand and well, glorious structures. And church anthems and hymns were not written for the harmonica or the kazoo. They were written with huge pipe organs in mind or more humble, but just as beautiful, grand pianos. Glory be! The Greek visitors came saying, we wish to see Jesus. We want to see who is the glorious one sent by a glorious God. And they were shown one who spoke of his life as a grain of wheat, dead in the earth, his glory at his death. Those weighted with this world's glory often revel in the glory of power and wealth and success. But Jesus reveals a different kind of glory. It is glory to be found in the ordinary, the mundane, even in the midst of the most unlikely of places and circumstances the teacher who gives a lifetime to a small rural school. The outreach worker who pours out his or her life in acts of compassion to the marginalized. The single parent who works two jobs so children don't go without. The nurse who regularly dispenses not only medicine but loving concern. The chorister who gives up every Thursday evening or early Sunday morning to enrich the experience for worshipers. The coach who gives up much of the weekend so inner city youngsters can know the joy of organized sport. The friend or neighbor who takes time to lovingly listen to someone having difficulties in their lives. 
The volunteers whose often unseen efforts are what sustains and enlivens a community or a congregation. We sing no doxology to them. But that is where true glory is, says Jesus. The glory of God always breaks into the midst of the ordinary. Writer Edgar Moore points out that such glory may be less visible, less noticeable, and yet it is glory all the same. He considers the nature of the rainbow in the story of Noah and the ark. The story is one that we may feel we need to outgrow as we mature in fame. After all, the math, the buoyancy problems, the animal management issues, and frankly the air quality challenges below decks, makes this account one of those easily consigned to the category of mythic fable. But a physicist friend of Moore's once remarked regarding the rainbow, this beautiful yet ordinary phenomenon, that the rainbow God summoned up to serve as a covenant sign for Noah was the most sophisticated part of the story. We see only part of the rainbow, he said, because of the limits of our human visual spectrum. There's much more to the rainbow than we can imagine. This theme of the limits of ordinary vision runs throughout the Gospel of John. In John's third chapter, Jesus tells Nicodemus he'll never see the kingdom of God unless he is born from above. And when some Greeks who come from Jerusalem for the Passover tell Philip they wish to see Jesus, the theme surfaces again. Human vision, unaided by the refractive grace of the Holy Spirit, can discern only part of the truth. This is why, when word about these curious Greeks reaches Jesus, he responds with the discourse on glorification that culminates in a prediction of the crucifixion. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. To see Jesus as God's Son, as, as Messiah, as Savior, is to see through the lens of God's Spirit. It is to see what is beyond the immediate visual spectrum. It is to discern the great purposes of God being worked out in the impending passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The drama John unfolds in his language of glorification. The Greeks who approached Philip may have wished merely to see Jesus of Nazareth with a cover of Time magazine glory. Man of the year, miracle worker, exemplary orator and storyteller, charismatic leader. But John wants us to see through a lens that sees Jesus' glory unfolding in the mundane, ordinary events of life. And the church has inherited from John the conviction that perceiving the inbreaking of the kingdom of God in the midst of the ordinary, even in the midst of the underbelly of ordinary life, is foundational to its proclamation of the gospel. In the ordinary events of life, Jesus' extraordinary glory is revealed. In the meals shared with rich and poor, saint and sinner, in the common experience of sickness and death, in triumph and tragedy, Christ's glory is seen in the stories of healing, forgiveness, transformation, and new life. That is what John means by glorification. Not only that Mary's boy, born in Bethlehem, is now revealed by the cross and resurrection as Lord and Savior, but also that the church now understands who and what it must be in response to this revelation. The church, as in the case in some conservative denominations, it's not meant to be a lifeboat to escape worldly troubles and sufferings. And the church, as in some liberal congregations, is not meant to be simply a social club or merely a social justice organization. The church is meant to be a receptor and reflector of Christ's glory. To bear that glory, the glory that comes from carrying on his work, indeed sharing his work as the risen Christ, the glory of humility and of love, the glory that heals and reconciles and enables new life to happen. So when we come looking for Jesus, what we see can really surprise us. 
In the Christ, we behold God's countering of this world's glory with a different glory. Many a communion table is adorned with a golden cross. He stooped under a cross of wood. We put crowns weighty with gold on those we exalt. His crown is light. Thorns are not weighty. We study, work, and strive so that we may be weighty enough so as never to be required to stoop to anyone. He enacted glory stooped with basin and towel. The crowd wanted to hail him as king on Palm Sunday, and by week's end he knelt down to wash tired feet. In beholding his glory, we are required to redefine the weight of glory. He became as a grain of wheat cast to the earth buried under sod, suffered, died. His glory, his exaltation was when finally he was lifted up from the earth. And the only time he was lifted up high enough to look down upon us from the heights of glory was when he looked down at us from his cross. Jesus said, God, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. I will conclude with a story that is one portrayal of the nature of this strange glory. Japanese writer Shisako Endo thought about the pain of God, not the power of God, but God's love, God's condescendence, not God's transcendence, which we in the West have so often emphasized. Endo tells the story out of the past. The Jesuits came to Japan in the 16th century, and there was a mass conversion to the Christian faith. But then came the European traders and their arrogance. As a result, there was a backlash among the Japanese against the Christians. The persecution of Japanese Christians was begun. And in the story, Rodriguez, a Jesuit, has traveled to Japan to find out why his most esteemed Japanese teacher has recanted his Christian faith. Now, Rodriguez is a most devout man. He spends most of his time in prayer and contemplation, in Bible study and worship. He is devoted to God and loyal to Christ. Soon after Rodriguez arrives in Japan, because of his faith, he runs afoul of the authorities who capture him and put him in a small, dark prison cell. While he is there, he thinks he hears snoring coming from nearby, and he supposes that it is the snoring of some drunken guards. And then he is told that it is, in fact, the labored, awful breathings of some former Japanese Christians who have long ago, after torture, apostatized forsaken their Christian faith, but have nevertheless been hung upside down with their faces half buried in human excrement. Well, Rodriguez is absolutely horrified at the thought of their plight. So his captors tell him that they will free these wretched prisoners if Rodriguez will only apostatize. If he will just reject Christ, they will free these people and let him go. And as it turns out, his esteemed teacher is one of those prisoners. They bring Rodriguez out of his cell and present, him, present before him a small image of Christ done in bronze. And all he has to do, he is told, is a mere bureaucratic formality. They tell him to just put his toe ever so slightly on the image of Christ, and those prisoners will be set free. And Rodriguez wants to take that image which has been marked by a thousand toes that have trampled upon it. He wants to take it and he wants to kiss it. But Rodriguez raises his foot. In it he feels dull, heavy pain. For him, it is not simply some sort of mere formality. For he is being tempted to trample upon and deny the most beautiful thing in his life. That image of the one to whom he has devoted his life, the one that has taught him all the good and ideals of his life. And then he hears a voice. The voice of the Christ in bronze, breaking the silence. He speaks to the tormented priest, Trample! Trample! I more than anyone know the pain in your foot. 
I came to be trampled upon. Trample. It was to share your pain that I carried my cross. Put your foot down. Trample on me. And then Rodriguez puts his foot down on the Christ. And the crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Thanks and praise to God whose glory is revealed in the ordinary, the mundane, even in the underbelly of life. Thanks and praise to God whose glory is revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, and whose glory continues to shine in and through us as we carry on his mission of sacrificial love, bringing healing and new life to the world. Amen. And the hymn of response to today's message is found at Voices United, number 186. Now the green wave rises. springtime begins, sow the seeds of God's love as you offer your gifts to God. Let us pray. 
Gracious God, bless and transform all that we offer, our faltering steps, our brokenness, our hope, our risking, our hearts, that your covenant may be written on our hearts and we may be a blessed and transformed covenant people. In Jesus' name we pray. in our minds in prayer. Steadfast God, in the midst of unending change and challenge, we give you thanks for your presence to sustain us. While we find it hard to understand why certain things happen, we are grateful that you are with us. You understand our fears, you support and guide us and you give us courage to face the unknown. We give thanks that you intend goodness for us, that your gift of faith is a solid rock which supports us, and that prayer gives us the hope you keep working in ways seen and unseen for goodness to prevail. Loving God, in this time of uncertainty when there is much to be anxious about, we pray for the world you love, Send your healing spirit to guide countries and communities as they respond to COVID-19. Bless the work of medical researchers and frontline healthcare workers in these stressful times. Bless the plan to offer vaccine to all who want it and give us patience and common sense as we wait our turns for vaccination. Send your healing spirit to bring peace and justice to troubled places such as Nigeria, Syria, Myanmar, Ethiopia, Hong Kong, to refugees and displaced persons, to all those whose lives are impacted by attitudes and acts of oppression or by inequities created by systems or structures that favor one people, group, or nation over another. Bring care and comfort to those who have been hurt in conflict. Wisdom to those who offer leadership in their communities. And courage to those who advocate for the most vulnerable. Send your healing spirit to mend relationships between religious groups and cultural groups who find themselves in tension or turmoil. We pray for mutual respect to grow between peoples who look at each other with suspicion and among people who've experienced painful histories with each other. Open our hearts and minds to those situations and concerns we don't understand and bring your gift of reconciliation to us all. Send your healing spirit to people we know and the earth you love. We remember before you friends in grief. Relationships marked by tension. Those facing difficulty at work or finding work. Disagreements in our church or community. Concerns about the environment upon which our lives depend. O oh God, we pray for the continuing ministry of the church in our neighborhoods and around the world. Bless our church, the Congregation of Central Saanich United Church, to serve you well, O God, in its various ministries, and to be faithful to you in its life and work. 
As we prepare for Holy Week and to celebrate at Easter, rejoicing at Christ's resurrection, help us plan safely and creatively. Send your healing spirit to raise our hearts and our hopes with the promise of new life in Christ. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain in us a willing spirit. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, sing aloud and together, our Father, our Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our voice is united 697. And finally, oh, oh, Lord. Thank you. Yeah. 